our summer uh, series called Loving One Another starts today. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend about half the message today preaching into this overall topic of, of loving one another and, and setting up the, the summer, setting up the series. And, and then I'm going to take the second part of today and preach on a specific topic within the series. And so uh, the specific topic today will be building up one another, but loving one another is the series. And here's what we're doing. We're, we're uh, looking at all the one another statements in the New Testament and a lot of them are from the Apostle Paul, a couple of them are from Jesus himself, but all the one another statements from the New Testament teaching us how to relate to, interact with, how to treat one another as the body of Christ. And uh, there's a, a, a really, really good book that some of you might have read. This book is called Building Up One Another by Dr. Gene Getz. And I'll, anytime I'm going to base a sermon or a sermon series off of a book or be inspired by something that somebody else has done, I always want to say it. So if you wanted to grab the book, you can, but it's called Building Up One Another, Dr. Gene Getz. This gives us the framework, though, this summer for what I believe God has to speak to our church for this season, in this time, I think part of my responsibility as uh, the leader is not only to teach the word, but also to hear from God on what he's wanting to tell our church family at this specific time, right? And so uh, God's been speaking to me. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute, but really speaking to me and encouraging me, getting me excited about this, this specific topic. And then um, as well, somebody gave me this book, and so I was reading through the book, and I was like, man, this is what we need this summer. And so I believe that all summer long, as we're talking about how to relate to each other, this is a word in season for each one of us. And so we'll be in John chapter 13, verse 35, uh, to, to start with, and this is going to kind of set up the whole series, but before we do that, can we just pray one more time? God, we, we open your word right now with expectation, with an excitement, leaning in because it's a word from you. We're not gathered today, God, just to go through the motions of church, but God, to be changed by you. Your word says that it cleanses us, it washes us. Let us be washed by your word today. Let us be built up by your word today. Let us be encouraged and challenged to be who you've called us to be. And let us be doers of your word. Let us leave here putting what we have heard into action. Holy Spirit, we need your help to do those things. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. The, this girl asked her dad if he could call her a taxi in five minutes. And so five minutes went by and, and he said, you're a taxi. Um, I know, I had multiple people tell me it was bad in the first service and I needed to change it, but I'm a little stubborn and, and I said, I'm not going to change it. I'm going to say it again. And a lot of times the reason that people don't laugh is because they don't get it because they don't have any sense of humor. Somebody told me in the lobby afterwards, they said, I don't get it. I said, you're a taxi. She said, call him a taxi. Call her a taxi. He said, you're a taxi. Anyway, okay, here we go. Loving one another. Loving one another. So... The one, the one another statements from, from the, the New Testament. I want to give you each week um, that we're going to, e each topic from, from each week this summer. I want to go ahead and give them to you so you know what to expect. But, and I'll put the Bible references next to it. If you want to take a picture of the screen or whatever you want to do, that's good. But this is what is going to happen each week. Starting today, second half of this message, we're going to talk about building up one another. Uh, the next week, members of one another. Then devoted to one another. How to honor one another, being of the same mind with one another, accepting one another, admonishing one another, greeting one another, serving one another, carrying one another's burdens, submitting to one another, encouraging one another. These are all commands of Scripture on how we should relate to each other, ultimately showing us how we should love one another. And so all summer long, every time you show up to church, we're going to be talking about how to treat, how to interact with one another. Now, um, this is what God's been speaking to me, and it has to do with the the verse that is the foundation for our church's name, which is John 13, 35. Um, about four years ago, see, God, had, when my wife Brittany and I transitioned into the leadership of this church in 2019, even prior to that, God had put this name on our hearts, spoken to us this name, Love Church, 
on our hearts and that that would become not only a name but what we would be known for is our love for one another as Jesus described in John 13, 35. And so for four years that's been our name and will continue to be our name. And uh, it's, it's a great verse that is inspiring and that we all kind of understand you're going to be known by your love for each other. But here's what God has been speaking to me specifically lately is to whom and how that love is directed. And so I want to read John 13, 35 first. It says this, by this, this is Jesus talking, all people will know that you are my disciples. So by what he's about to say, Here's how people are going to know you're my disciples. If you have love for one another. If you have love for one another. There's that one another. This series is called Loving One Another. Now, over the last couple of months, here's how God has been speaking and kind of stirring me, bothering, if you will, me, when it comes to our primary call as a church. It's almost like God's been been telling me, hey, Josh, we can't miss this. You can't miss this. You need to focus on this. And so as I'm telling you, I'm telling you what God is telling me about our church because we are the church. And I feel like this is a great thing to do is to communicate what is, what do I feel like God is leading us in? Where is God leading us? What is God speaking? And so this is what he's been speaking over the last couple of months is we need to love each other well. Not just love the world and not just have, you know, just a like a, a broad love, of course we need to be loving people, and of course we need to love the world. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Jesus wasn't saying you're going to be known for your love, and this is what has become so clear to me and so loud to me over the last couple of months is what Jesus' point was is other people are going to recognize you as real Christians by how you treat each other. It's not just how you love. That's not what he was saying. You're going to be known, NLT says, you're going to prove to the world that you're my followers by how you love each other. The world takes notice when we love each other well. Why? Because they want that type of community. And and so Jesus says this, and I don't want us to miss this. In fact, we're going to take the summer and focus on this. How do we love, not just love, love one another well? This concept is our highest calling, is to love and to care for the family of God. And at the risk of sounding inward and closed off to the world, because I know to some that's how it could sound. That's not what we're saying. But it must be said that our highest command is to love and care for our own first. This is biblical. See, and you might say, well, what about the gospel? And it brought in everybody. Yes, here, here's what I need you to understand today. The gospel broke down every barrier that had been put up by the law that in the Old Covenant. In the Old Covenant, it was the Jews, and then the Gentiles were the non-Jews. And the Jews were set apart by God as God's people because God's a holy God, and he had his set-apart people. And so the Old Covenant in the Old Covenant, there was the covenant people of God. In the Gospels, what you're going to see, and in, in a lot of the New Testament, what you're going to see is the undoing of the Jewish thinking and the Jewish model that there are insiders and that there are outsiders. And so when we talk about Jew, Gentile, slave, free, like we're, what we're saying is what Jesus did was he obliterated every barrier. And now all are welcome to be in the family of God. So So the gospel tears down all the barriers, but the gospel did not change the principles of God and who God is and how God has ordered the world that we are called first to home and then to go outside. And so now, even though everybody's welcome in, that doesn't change the priority that we are called to love and to build up one another to create a strong community so that when we reach out, there is, there is power when we reach out. There's something to bring people into. There is love. There is a thriving community that can help bring healing and wholeness to people who so desperately need it. That doesn't happen unless we know, unless we have the revelation of loving and building the family of God. I'll give you a couple scriptural examples. Um, you might remember the, when, when the Corinthians were being corrected by Paul for mistreating the poor. Uh, the, the poor are being neglected, and, and people aren't paying attention to those that are in need. That's not just the poor. 
That's not just like the people on the street corner. You're neglecting the people on the street corner that are poor. Those were, those were Christians in Corinth. They were a part of the church in Corinth. They were poor people in the church that were being neglected in the distributions, that were being neglected. People weren't paying attention to them. They weren't, they weren't acknowledging them. They weren't helping them. And they get, they get corrected because they weren't helping the poor within their church community. Another example is when famous passage, and we, a lot of times we hear this passage when it comes to outreach. And again, out, outreach, this can apply to outreach. That's great. But when Jesus says what you do for the least of these, you do for me. Y'all remember that? When you clothe them, when you feed them, you're, feed, you're feeding and clothing me. And the disciples ask what he means, and Jesus explains it. You can go read this for yourself. When Jesus is talking, he, he uses the word those at my right hand and those at my left, and that's symbolic. Those at his right hand are his people, and those that are left will be cast into hell. He says he's talking about how you treat each other on my right hand, if you help each other, if you help my children. And he says when you help my children, you're helping me. And I want you to... I want you to catch this today. When he says that, why is, like, why is that? Why is he saying when you do it for them, you're doing it for me? Because when you do it for them, they're the body. Jesus describes the church. The Bible describes the church with a couple of metaphors. you got, you got the main metaphors are the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. When you, when you help the body of Christ, you're helping Christ. Are you following me? He's not saying when you... When you do that for anyone, when you do it for somebody that's not a part of the family of God, you're not doing it for God. That specific passage, Jesus is saying when you do it for them, you're doing it for me. You're caring for your own. You're caring for the church. God cares about how we care for his body. So you might be saying, you know, what about the outsiders, Josh, and what about the, no, no, this series is not to say it's one or the other. This is series is to say this summer we're going to talk about what it looks like to love one another in here. There are series for other things. There are seasons for other things. There are messages for going out, preaching the gospel to all creation, making disciples of them, not only in Jerusalem, but Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, and that is all the way to the people who are not inside. All of that is true. This summer we are focusing on how do we build up this family and this body so that we can be a place where people can come and find healing and wholeness and be repaired and be restored and be discipled. And, and, and so I just don't want us to, be, you know, the, the pastor who pastors people and and his family is falling apart at home, or the marriage counselor who's counseling marriage one after another in the day, and then the marriage is falling apart at home. We want to be a church who we're not distracted by what we're doing out there, and we end up accidentally or purposefully neglecting those that are in here. For Jesus says, you got to love each other well, for this is the way that the world is going to see you. It's how you operate as a church community. So that's what we're going to be that's what we're going to be talking about. Our, our danger, I, I believe this, this is not Bible. I want to make sure I delineate when I'm talking Bible and when I'm just giving you my opinion. But my opinion that I think is right, obviously, which is why I'm giving it to you, <laughs> is that, that our church in this day and age, in this time where we live, the day, in the time that we live in, we're... We're not really in danger of being closed off to the outsider. Like the church at large, the American church or the evangelical church, I should say, at large has gotten, like, good at being welcoming towards people. You remember that if you've been around church for a while? Like, this is when I was a kid. Like, 30 years ago, we started saying things like, come as you are. You can dress however you want. You can wear jeans. It doesn't matter what, all backgrounds, all, like, we've, we're good at that now, you know, and and it's very welcoming, and we, we have kind of like flipped, like people, the, the church in general is pretty good at that. And here's the thing, we live in a society, that it's like a societal norm, very inclusive society. So we're not really in danger of being closed off to the world, love church. Like we've we got that part down. What I think that we could be in danger of is forgetting our primary call, that God wants a community of people where each person sees themselves as a part of the body with a necessary job in the mindset that says, I lay my life down for the rest of the body, and as I give to the rest of the body, then I am also built up this concept that I'm here to build God's house. 
That's what we're talking about. I want to, before I move into our specific topic today, I just want to read this passage by Jesus um, in John 15. And it's a, another famous passage about loving one another. You're going to start noticing the one another phrase now. It's like when you see a car, when you, when you think about a car and you start seeing it everywhere, you know what I'm saying? You're going to start seeing one another in Scripture over and over again. But in John 15, 12 through 25, there are two paragraphs here that I'm going to read. And in, in the NASB Bible uh, and in some other translations too, the header says before verse 12 that we're about to read, disciples' relation to each other. Then we're going to read a paragraph after that that's the disciples' relation to the world. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus is going to tell you, here's how you relate to each other. Here's your mindset. And then here's your mindset of, of relating to the world. That's, that's how this is broken up. So let's start at verse 12. Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends, because all things that I have heard from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the father in my name, he may give to you. This is my command, that you love one another. Everybody say that together. Love one another. This is a thing that preachers do to make sure that you're not falling asleep. All right, so we're all together. Here we go. Verse 18, here's where the header changes to the disciples' relation to the world. That's what the header says in, in this translation I'm reading. So here's how we relate to the world. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you as well. If they followed my word, they will follow yours also. Pause. This is very important for us today. We are again, I'm just saying it up front once. I'm not going to continue to say this. We are not saying that we don't love the world. Okay? We're all on the same page. But when you get obsessed with how the world is going to receive you, or you get you, you start to get distracted by trying to make yourselves or the gospel or church relatable to the world. And, and you start taking the, what should be only God's business into your hands trying to convince the world or relate to the world or be relevant to the world. And become in danger of forgetting who you are or, or drifting from beliefs that your whole faith is founded on, you end up in, an, in a, maybe even a genuine desire to love the world. You end up taking God's place. What Jesus is saying right here is he's saying, they hated me. And if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And then he goes, but some of them followed me. And if they followed me, they're going to follow you. Church, we need to hear this today. This is going to save you a lot of heartache, and it's going to help you be a better follower of Jesus. Not everybody is going to like you or church or Jesus. And so it's not saying, well, then forget about them then. No, 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 no. It's saying live the life that God has called you to live. Preach the gospel to creation operate as his church, and that's what we're talking about all summer, the way that you're supposed to operate, love each other, build the community of faith, and listen, and those that are going to be saved by God are going to be saved. Those that are going to follow him are going to follow him, and those that aren't going to won't, and you need to be okay with that part and stop trying to do every, stop trying to get outside of your role, and and what can happen if we're not careful is churches or Sections of the church can end up in such an effort to try to appease the world and relate to the world. They lose who they are. And so Jesus goes on to say in verse 21, all these things they'll do to you on account of my name because they they don't know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. The one who hates me hates my father also. 
If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But this has happened so that the word that is written in their law will be fulfilled. They hated me for no reason. He goes on in verse in chapter 16 to say, when they kill you, when they kill you, don't be surprised for your martyrdom is an offering to the Lord. So, so when Jesus is telling us how to relate to the world, he's making sure that, he, that we know like they're going to hate you. There's going to be people who are going to hate you, persecute you. He's telling them, kill you. Uh, so don't be surprised about that because it, they, they hated me too, but some are going to follow me as well. So just let, let's live the life that he's called us to live. This is so important for us today. So for those of us that want to live at peace and live in harmony with the world, you're going to be disappointed with this faith. We are called to live in harmony with one another. That's one of the calls, the harmony with one another. But if you want to live in harmony with the world, I'm just tr- I'm tr- trying to save you time. It might not be as that popular of a message, but I'm just trying to save you energy. If you want to live at peace and harmony with the world, this is going to be tough for you. But we are called to live in harmony with one another. And to reach the world as a body, as a church, we are called to preach the gospel and to serve the world and to go out, but out of a place of strength. So part one is specifically building up one another. Uh, This is one of the phrases that we see in scripture. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16 today for this particular topic. Uh, Ephesians 4, chapter 1, this is uh, a, a passage about building up the church. You need to know today as a group of people, as a church body, as followers of Christ, here's one of our identifying marks. We are people that build up people. The church is not a place that criticizes and and condemns and pulls down people and tears down people and cancels people. Come on, the people of God are a building up people. We build people up. We want to edify the church. We want to build people up. We want to encourage people. We want to make people better. We are not people who tear people down. We are people who build people up. Not competing with, not controlling or manipulating, comparing, criticizing. No, no. We build people up. And this passage is about building up the body of Christ. Let's read it together. Verse 1. Therefore I, Paul says, a prisoner of the Lord urge you, urge you to walk worthy, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with, here it is again, one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. For there is, remember this passage is a church passage, as many of these are. This is not talking about one with the world, this is one with each other. There is one body One spirit, just as you were called into one hope of the calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. It's powerful. Verse 7, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive the captives and he gave gifts to people. He goes on in verse 11 to say, and he gave some As apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. I want to pause there and notice what he said. He references some gifts that God through his spirit have given to the church, and he's going to name some offices of the church. Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. He's saying God's given the church through the inspiration of the Spirit, these gifts, and they help the church not by only being the ones who minister to the church, but listen to specifically what Paul says. He gave them as gifts to the church for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry, and then he tells us what the work of the ministry is. It's building up the church. So follow this. That means that today as the pastor and the teacher, that I'm not just ministering to you. I hope today isn't the only time, this this morning isn't the only time that you're being ministered to. I pray that the message ministers to you. But I pray today is much more than just a ministry of this message to you. I pray it's more like an equipping for you to then leave this place and be the church and build up the church. 
That's how this is supposed to work because the saints are the ones, Paul says, that do the work of the ministry. Who's the saints? We're the saints. It's all of us. You're the saint. You're, you're a redeemed child of God. We are the people of God. And God has put the work of the ministry in our hands as the church. This is not a spectator sport. I know this is set up in a very Greek, if you will, way, whereas the Hebrew way was circles and we do life together and this is set up as a presentation and God bless it because this is necessary part of the church experience, but it's not the only part where you sit here and receive. No, you're being equipped with the tools needed. You're being equipped with the encouragement that's needed, with the charge that's needed to go out and, and to actually do the work of the ministry, which is the building up of God's church. This is what Paul's saying. So then he goes on to say, I'll unpause, until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, which is a mouthful, but it's a beautiful picture of the ultimate goal, which is the fullness of the stature of Christ. Like we are, the standard is Christ. We obviously aren't at that standard, and so grace covers the gap. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. And as grace is covering the gap, grace is also empowering us to continue to work our way to maturity so that we can obtain the standard, which is Christ. That's a lifetime journey, church. We'll say it about our mission as a church. It's one sentence, to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. How many know that's a lifetime mission? I'm on that journey. You're on that journey. There are some people in the room that you just started that journey. Maybe you're here and you haven't even started that journey because you haven't made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. There are some here who have been on that journey longer than I've been alive. But, hey, we're all on the journey. And as a church, we are all called to build each other up on that journey, to help people become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Verse 14, I'll finish with this. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for, here it is, the building up of itself in love, church. (laughs) That was my exclamation mark. It's interesting that when it says, the fitting together, this is a, a long word that, that is made up of three Greek root words. One is sun, which means uh, S-U-N, which means uh, tightly knit with tight identification. The other one is harmos, which is where we get the word harmony. So we're living in harmony with each other. If you know anything about music, that means there are multiple notes that are playing a beautiful chord. They're not all the same note but they go together in harmony. And then the last word that's used, ready for this? Lego. It's the Greek word Lego, which I guess is where Lego got their name. Seriously. And that means that each piece fits together. Have you ever done Legos? Each one of those individual Legos is not impressive at all. In fact, that can do damage to a parent. If you step on one of those Legos, that'll do damage. That'll cause you to cuss right there. I'll tell you what. If you never cuss before, you step on a Lego. That'll do the trick right there. But Legos aren't that impressive. But have you ever seen one of those big 10,000-piece Lego sets building like the Star Wars, whatever it is. I don't watch Star Wars and and stuff like that. Y'all seen that? It's beautiful because every part is doing its, its own job. That's literally what that word is made of when we're fitted together like Legos. We all, we're all doing our part. This is what happens for the building up of the body of Christ. So I want to just spend our remaining few minutes by looking at kind of this this paragraph, this thought from Paul, if if I can, divide it into two parts. He says, walk worthy in in a manner. This is the building up. 
passage. Walk worthy in a manner. And then he talks about what walking worthy looks like. We'll talk about that. And then he says the result of that is. And so I just want to look at those two things. The first thing is to walk worthy. Walk worthy simply means to, to walk in a manner that's reflective of what Christ did. So I want to make sure that we're clear that that doesn't mean that we walk perfectly. Because inherent in Christ's work is the fact that we weren't worthy and couldn't do it, and we were imperfect, so he had to save us. So therefore, walking worthy is, has that in mind, that every day when we wake up, we're still living by the grace of God, right? We're walking with him by his grace. Like, we're, we're not perfect. And in fact, to walk in a way that pretends to be perfect is actually not worthy, because you are denying the cross. The, the, the whole reason that, God, that Jesus had to die on the cross was because we sinned and earned that death. So walking worthy doesn't mean walking in perfection. But it also, that would be a ditch that we could fall into, so to speak. You guys remember the ditch analogy. But the other side would be just living, oh, well, the grace of God covers me. It doesn't matter how I live. That's also not in a manner worthy because it doesn't reflect what Jesus did. Jesus gave his entire life. It would be like spitting in his face, a dog returning to vomit to just continue to do the very sins that he gave his entire life to forgive you of. And so living in a manner worthy simply lives in this way to say, I'm saved by grace I'm imperfect, but I'm, I desire through the power of the Spirit to, to become, to be formed into the image of Christ. To look more like him tomorrow than today, next year than this year. For my life to be, to be growing and for me to be being formed because he gave everything for me. So I'm going to give everything that I can to become more like him. That's living worthy. And he's going to describe it now. This is not exhaustive, but he's going to describe, hey, live in a manner that's worthy of the call. And here's some things. So we're going to be doing this all summer, but I'm just going to simply have us just look at what Paul says. Live in a manner worthy of the call. And here's how you can do it. I'll put them up here. I just kind of categorize them into four thoughts. The first is humble and gentle. These go together. He says you're going to do it with gentleness and humility. Humility and gentleness is what he specifically says. So church, love church, we need to know today that we need, as we're walking out this walk, as we're living this life, we need to live, Paul says, to live worthy of the call, we need to live in humility. The the second value of our church is humble confidence. Because humility says it's not about me. Confidence, the reason we're confident, is because it's not up to me, it's up to him. And so, we want to be a church, not that it's like, the reason we put humble confidence is because it's not like, oh, we stink. We're not good. We're just poor old us. That's not, the, that's not what humility is. Humility is just realizing it's not about you. Get over yourself. It's about him. So humble confidence looks like this. We can do amazing things. We, we, can, we can see the impossible happen. We can build his church. We can see great things happen because it's his. And he's amazing. So as we walk in step with him, we expect to see God do great things. We want to have a great church with great ministry to our people and to our community. Great worship, great preaching, great kids ministry, great youth ministry. We want all of that, but it's because he's great. We want this attitude, though, that says, but it's not about us. And that's the quickest way to not ever get on our stage or in a place of influence is to be full of yourself. It is, we just want preaching and worship leading and teaching and kids ministry and small group leaders who are just not that into themselves. That, that we have the attitude that says, I want to decrease so that he can increase. I'm not taking myself too seriously. We can laugh. I, I'm not thinking too much of myself. It's, it's we want to make much of God, though. We want to make much of Jesus every time we're gathered. We make a big deal about him because he's a big deal. We want to make a big deal about the gospel. We want to make a big deal about church because church is a big deal to God. So we just need to know what to make a big deal of. And sometimes, as yes, Christians, we can make a big deal, try to make a big deal of ourselves. And everybody's like, they see through it. Like, You're not that big of a deal. All right. 
So we want to be humble and gentle. Jesus said in Matthew 20, uh, 11, 28, come to me all who are weary, heavy burdened. Come to me. He says, I'll give you rest. And then he says, for I am, and then here it is, humble and gentle. Or gentle and humble. I don't know which one he says first, at heart. If we want to be like Christ, if we want to walk in a manner worthy of Christ, let's be people who are humble and then paired right along with that, gentle with his flock, which leads into the next thing that he says, which is patient and bearing. Patient, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Patience is pretty easy to understand. It goes along with this next word that is translated, bearing with one another. And specifically, it says, and I'm going to give you the specific uh, definition of this word because the direct translation, because I think it's very important that we understand it. The bearing is also translated tolerant with one another in love. And I like that picture of tolerant because it, of course, does our culture, we have a, tolerance can carry a connotation, of course, that I'm not saying, I'm not talking about being tolerant towards sin. Um, but, the, but specifically, the word tolerant means being tolerant with people's brokenness and with their journey, like being able to put up with them, being patient with people, and, and ready, tolerant with their imperfections, tolerant towards their journey, not tolerant towards sin, not, not tolerant towards standards, not any of that, being tolerant towards the person, realizing they're broken, they're on a journey, and thank God that he was tolerant with me and is with me, as I'm also imperfect on this journey, Paul is saying you need to be humble and gentle. And you need to be, if you're going to build up each other, you need to be patient and bear with one another. Out of the love that God has shown you, you need to, to bear with each other as they're trying to figure it out. May our, may our church always just, I mean, and this takes the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you ever can... Say that you're totally getting this 100% right. This is more of a, a journey. But may we always be a place that stays intolerant of sin and evil, but just so patient with people, tolerant of their brokenness, understanding that this is not a country club for those who have it all together, but a hospital for people that are sick and hurting in spirit. May we always be able to marry the truth of God's word, the standards of God's kingdom, yet have the heart of our Savior. And he never compromised on either one. He was gentle and humble at heart. He was patient with us. God's long-suffering towards us. And then the third thing that he says is unity and peace. He says being Diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. God tells us to be unified, but we don't, He's not saying we don't unify around things that He doesn't tell us to unify over. We're different in some ways, but we are unified in other ways, and He's pretty clear. He's unified in one Spirit. It's one Father, it's one Lord, it's one faith, it's one baptism. Like we're unified around the big things, the reason that we're here. And there might be other secondary things or social things or political things that we're not really unified over, but that's not what makes us a church anyway. What makes us a church, a fellowship, a, the people of God, is that we're unified around the main things, that God is who he says he is, that he sent Jesus to die for us, that we're saved by faith through grace because of what Jesus has done, filled with the Spirit, producing fruit. The word of God is perfect, the standard, never changing. And then beyond that, there are things that make us different and ways in which we are wired that are different and way, different giftings that we have. And that's what creates the harmony of the body. But how many know we got to fight for unity? He says be diligent to keep unity. That means unity doesn't just happen automatically. It's going to take diligence. You don't, you don't go to the gym and just get in shape once. you got to continue to go if you want to attain fitness. And he says you got to be diligent to maintain unity in the house of God. 
And then, and then he says, exercising our, he, he begins to talk about the gifts that God gave to his people. And, and, and specifically here in Ephesians 4, it, it's, the, it's the gifts which are the people or the offices within the church. But here, here's the, the picture that he paints going all the way through that passage that we already focused on, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, is he's saying that we are called to exercise our gifts to build up the church. If we want to walk in a manner worthy of the calling, we have been called out of darkness and into his glorious light, placed in the family of God, given a responsibility in that family. And if we want to live a life that reflects that, we have to exercise our gifts for the building up of the church. We've talked about that over the last couple of weeks. Here it is again as we started a brand new series, a whole brand new concept, the building up of one another. But there it is again in order for us to build this church. And I'm not talking about the building, but thank God for the building that will come. But for us to build this community, for us to build this fellowship, we need every person to use what God has given them to do the work of the ministry for the building up of his church. There are some examples of people that build up the church that I just, as I was preparing the message, I was thinking about them. To be clear, you don't only use your gifts on the serve team at church, like on Sunday or on a specific team. You use your spiritual gifts as you relate to people in your friendships, in your small groups, in your marriage, at your home. Like, this is building up the church, the the fellowship of believers. I want to be clear about that, but... There are some examples here at church. We talked about serve teams earlier. We have a serve team uh, picnic this Saturday. Come on. But, but some serve teams, I was thinking about the set up and take down team. Like wave your hand in here if you set up or take down uh, like once in a, at least once in a month. Just raise your hand. If you set up or take down this church once in a month, raise your hand high. Raise your hand high. Now, I want you to look around and look at all the people that are lifting their hands saying, I set this church up and take it down once a month. Listen, you're building the church. I, actually, y'all literally are building the church. You build it. Yeah, every, every week you build it with pipe and drape and banners and all that. You build it. But we have this experience every week because there are people who have the revelation that I can give of my time. I have the physical ability to push a cart or to hang some pipe and drape or to take it down, and I'm going to give of my time for the building of the church. Like, this doesn't happen without that team that's here before many of you woke up today and that will be here pushing carts onto those hot trailers after you're already gone and eating lunch. That was my warning, you guys. It is going to be hot out there, all right? But we're going to do it together, and I'm going to stop preaching in a minute so we can take it all down. But how many are thankful for the people who build, they build the church? I was thinking of our kids' team. Thinking of our kids' team. Raise your hand if you teach kids. There are a bunch of them in the first service. Raise your hand if you, if you serve in our kids' ministry right now. You served in the first service probably. And you're here in the, in the second service. A lot of our kids, more, the, more than you, serve in this service because there's more kids in the second service. You need to know if you lifted a hand, you are literally building the church. These children are learning about God. They're learning about the Bible, Bible stories, foundational aspects of faith because you're teaching them. Statistics show that these kids will grow up. There's a good chance that the kids that you're teaching will grow up to follow God. Even if they walk away from God, they'll come back to God because of the foundation that you're laying. You are building the church. Do you understand that God is pleased with you? I know this sounds so obvious, and I know a lot of you know this, but I'm just taking a moment to say, like, you're building his house. This is his bride. You think he cares about it? He calls it his bride, his body, and you're building it, and you're building the future of it as you're teaching these kids. All of our small group leaders, connect system, prayer teams, all those kind of those pastoral areas. Raise your hand if you lead a small group, serve on a prayer team, or serve in our connect system. Raise your hand right now. If you lead a small group, serve on a connect team, serve in prayer. Let's put our hands together for everybody who's leading people. (laughs) Raise your hand if you're on a guest experience team. Ushers, greeters, parking, safety, environment, events, food and beverage. Raise your hand if you're on one of those teams that I just said. Raise your hand. Look, you're building the church. You're building the church. Those are, those are just examples of we walk in gentleness and humility, patience and forbearance, unity and peace, exercising our gifts 
for the building up of the body of Christ. It's a beautiful thing. And the result is, oh, we won't be like children anymore. We won't be like children anymore. Because we come into the family of God as children. Adopted into his family. Are you thankful for that? He doesn't want you to stay a child, though. There are many grown men and women who are still children in, in emotionally or children spiritually. And, and we don't want to stay children. We want to grow up into maturity. We want to grow up into, and so that's the result. When we build his church, we'll no longer be like children, but we'll be speaking the truth in love, growing in all aspects of what, how God has called us to live. And, and you need to, to know, I close with this, that as you build the church, as you build others, here's the cool thing, God builds you. As you build others, God builds you. You ever heard the phrase, you build his house and he'll build yours? You might have thought that was a Bible verse. It's not a Bible verse. But it's a biblical concept that as you build God's people, as you build God's house, guess what? You're a part of God's house as well. And so as you build, God is building you. This is what it looks like to be a part of the church, God's family. How many are, how many are thankful? to be able to be a part of his church. As you build him and his church, as you build what he's building, he builds you. And for those that are involved and those that have given your life to volunteer and to serve and to serve people and love people in, in the different ways that God has blessed you in, then you know that your life is better because of it. And so I just pray that today encourages you, teaches you something, that it motivates you to remember that you're needed for the building of God's house. You're a necessary Lego piece. But don't be out there just sitting on the floor by yourself. You're going to hurt somebody. Get, get in, the, get in, get in the, the design of God. That's good. Yeah, okay. That was to make up for my dad joke earlier. Let's, let's use our gifts to, to build up the house of God. And all summer long, we're going to be talking about how to love one another well.